In this lecture, we will be examining the emergence of what became known as the third party system. The term reflects a form of periodization used by political historians to denote American political history from about 1854 to the mid 1890s. This era is delineated by its differences with the periods known as the second party system, which was dominated by the Democratic and the Whig parties from roughly 1828 to 1854, and the fourth party system, which is typically defined as the Republican dominated period from 1896 to 1932. The second party system came to a demise as a result of the emergence of slavery in the 1850s as the single most divisive issue in American politics. Disagreements over slavery led to the split of the Democratic Party into northern and southern factions, and the newly emergent Republican Party, led by Abraham Lincoln, exploited this divide to win the presidency in 1860. The image on this slide is an 1893 American cartoon uh, depicting President Grover Cleveland unsuccessfully attempting to manipulate the machinery of the Democratic Party as one would a typewriter, or these days a keyboard. I forgot we don't uh, use typewriters anymore. Uh, there are a number of distinct features of the third party system. Hierarchical and centralized party structures were an important element of the third party system. This period exhibited uh, very high levels of voter interest as well as high voter turnout rates, um, oftentimes ex exceeding 80%. In general, members of political parties demonstrated unwavering party loyalty. It was somewhat rare for people to switch parties in this partisan-obsessed era. Nominating conventions were an important component of the third party system and parties uh, began to use these conventions not only as a way to fire up the party leadership, uh, but also to um, extend outward to party members across the country, and, and finally as a way to consolidate control over the party machinery. Another important factor of the third party system for much of its uh, life was the spoils system, which was used by party leaders to reward faithful party members and incentivize party work. This system would not begin to change until the 1883 Pendleton Act, which made the basis for government employment to be merit, although this only affected initially about 10% of civil service jobs at the federal level. Um, this um, support for the Pendleton Act, though, ultimately cost Republican President Chester A. Arthur a shot at re-election to the presidency in 1884. Uh, Republican machine bosses were so angry at what they reviewed as Arthur's treachery to the party that they worked against him at the 1884 Republican nominating convention, the sitting president. Finally, the third party era was noted for the rise of broad national coalitions of voting groups, which is in stark contrast with the uh, fairly strict regional sectionalism of the second party era. In the accompanying 1880 cartoon, uh, General Hancock, who was the uh, presidential nominee of the Democrats is with other party officials in, in a sort of freak show uh, highlighting violence of the Civil War era. The Democratic Party's iconic donkey is depicted as a coalition of the rear end of the South connected to the rear end of the North. This is obviously a, uh, a Republican um, leaning cartoonist. Still, while the uh, despite the uh, emphasis on coalitions, the Republicans did count heavily on the North and West as bases of strength, while the Democratic Party relied heavily on the South as well as major cities in the East and Midwest as centers for their party support. Religion played an important role uh, and in some respects, you might say the, the most important role in electoral politics during the Third Party era. Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Scandinavian Lutherans 
as well as other pietist groups in the North were closely associated with the Republican Party. Pietist and pietism refers to uh, personal piety. So these are uh, moralistic, at least at the time, were moralistic um, groups. Norwegian and Swedish Lutherans, for example, in a study by political historian Paul Kleppner, voted with Republicans over 80% of the time in the period from 1854 to 1892. And, and party leaders, of course, were very aware of um, the following they had in particular groups and uh, actively worked to cultivate and maintain their ties and support from these groups. Liturgical groups, such as Roman Catholics, German Lutherans, and Episcopalians turned to the Democratic Party from what they perceived as the excesses of pietistic moralism, especially the temperance movement against alcohol and saloons. Irish Catholics, for example, exhibited an 80-20 voting pattern in the second half of the 19th century in favor of the Democratic Party. Uh, the image accompanying this slide is of temperance advocate Carrie Nation with her trademark Bible and her trademark hatchet. Nation was uh, noted for entering saloons and chopping up the bar as a protest against what she perceived as the evils of alcohol. While both parties polled well among a wide variety of different socioeconomic demographics, the Democrats typically received more support from voters in lower socioeconomic groups, especially immigrants and the working class. In terms of local politics, uh, machine politics, also known as the boss system, was an important feature of the third party system. Political machines control who gets elected, and the principal focus of a political machine is to get out the vote. Uh, boss Tweed, William Tweed, pictured here in New York City, is perhaps the most recognizable, recognizable example of a political machine boss, Tweed and his operatives uh, provided help to immigrants in exchange for their votes. Government leaders then had to give the machine bosses kickbacks from government projects and even outright bribes in payment for the political debt they owed these bosses. Uh, these political machines provided some services and infrastructure for cities in a time of few, few social services and very little government intervention in the economy. Uh, however, these bosses were almost completely above the law as they manipulated and blackmailed politicians and judges by virtue of the fact that these government officials owed uh, everything to the machine bosses. On the national political scene, the post-Civil War third party system is noted for a relative lack of major issues facing voters. The policies pursued by the two major parties really did not differ much from each other in substance. Uh, they tended to both be relatively um, focused, heavily focused perhaps, on uh, laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, many elections were decided more on the popular appeal of the personalities of the candidates than on issues. Only two major issues seemed to divide the major parties at this time. The uh, the tariff controversy and uh, the nation's monetary policy. In terms of monetary policy, the country was divided over the ideal form of currency the country should emphasize. Bankers and business owners, largely supporting the Republicans, supported the gold standard, while Westerners preferred a silver standard in general. Poorer Americans and those with high levels of debt supported expansion of the supply of paper currency in small part due to the inflationary nature of paper currency since debtors uh, benefit in times of higher inflation because they pay back their older debts with devalued currency. However, part of the demand for an increase in the amount of paper currency in the economy was simply due to the fact that there was a shortage of bullion, which resulted in capital shortages due to the low supply of currency, and at times loans were difficult or impossible to obtain. Uh, the tariff controversy came to the forefront of national politics in the 1888 presidential election. Now, this had been a long-standing issue that simmered and festered for decades. Uh, Grover Cleveland um, 
proposed a significant reduction in tariffs in his annual message to Congress and, uh, in 1887. Uh, he argued the tariff was needlessly high and that pointless taxation was unjust taxation. Why tax if we don't need it? Tax for revenue only, he would say. The Republicans, led by Benjamin Harrison at the top of the electrical, electrical ticket, maintained high tariffs shielded American industrial production from foreign competitors, and that this helped maximize wages, profits, and economic growth. This was kind of a deceptive statement, though, um, because at the time, uh, the United States was one of the lowest cost producers of many goods um, in the international marketplace, and the Industrial Revolution, of course, was kicking the high gear by this time, and it's dubious to assert that the American economy really needed protection from foreign competitors. There might have been a few isolated cases where that was uh, substantiated, but on the whole, um, it didn't seem to be warranted. And given the fact that um, the period from 1873 to 1896 is sometimes referred to as the Long Depression, um, tariffs would inhibit uh, economic growth. Uh, anyway, uh, Cleveland eventually won the popular vote, but Harrison managed to win a few more electoral votes and became the 23rd president, including Cleveland's um, home state of New York. Had Cleveland um, won his home state, um, this would have been... Um, uh, a different election. Cleveland, though, did get his revenge uh, by winning back the presidency in uh, 1892. The 1896 presidential election is typically viewed as the end of the third party system. The bank panic and subsequent depression that began in 1893, which we'll discuss in an upcoming lecture, severely weakened support for President Grover Cleveland. Uh, populists also suffered an economic collapse. We will um, address them in an upcoming lecture as well. Uh, but by 1896, the populists and Democrats had uh, forged an uneasy alliance at the top against the uh, Republican candidate William McKinley. The monetary policy, as we will see, proved to be the pivotal electoral issue with populists and Democrats getting behind silver and Republicans preferring the gold standard. Yet the issues... Um, were in one sense less important in the 1896 presidential election than another factor, namely the emergence of interest groups as a powerful force in American politics. Due to the uh, civil service reforms we mentioned that began with the 1883 Pendleton Act, civil service jobs at the federal levels uh, were much less of an incentive to support a political party as most positions that had been traditionally part of the spoils system could no longer uh, be given away after elections. Republicans recognized this and uh, came up with a new plan. They encouraged business owners to donate directly to the party. The McKinley campaign invented a, a new form of campaign financing that has dominated American politics since that time. Instead of asking office holders to give back a portion of their pay, as was the case under the former spoil system, Republican strategist Mark Hanna uh, went to financial and industrial leaders and offered a business proposal. He, he explained that he thought William Jennings Bryan was going to win the election if nothing changed, and that uh, the McKinley team had a response that would be very expensive. Uh, but he asked business leaders how much it was worth to the business to defeat William Jennings Bryan, and then he'd propose a figure to the group individual uh, business, financial, banking leaders. More often than not, uh, business leaders would write him a check on the spot. Hannah uh, raised $3.5 million for the McKinley campaign, which seems rather paltry by today's standards, but this was a figure that was seven times greater than the money collected in donations by William Jennings Bryan, who despite a, uh, a spirited campaign, um, was trounced by McKinley in the national elections, and uh, American political campaigning was forever changed from this point. And this brings to a close our uh, brief look at the third party system.